So next, we'll have a talk by Dr. Mukesh Kapila, a veteran of humanitarian crisis and ethnic cleansing. We are indeed blessed, honored, and privileged to have Dr. Mukesh Kapila with us for the International Village Festival 2023. He'll be talking on the topic, humanitarianism, concept, and reality. Over to you now, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very happy to be here. I notice it's been a long morning already for you, and you've been sitting there uh, almost patiently and uh, without a break, so I'll try hard not to be uh, too long. And to talk a bit about uh, the humanitarian uh, business, business or the humanitarian uh, profession from my own experience around the world. I'm a physician by background, as you heard, but uh, have spent most of my life for the last 30, 40 years working in uh, various international organizations, the United Nations, the International uh, Red Cross, and as also the head of the humanitarian department in the British government for some time. And uh, it's uh, been uh, a strange part of uh, my destiny to actually see the worst that humanity can do to other people. So that has taken me to Rwanda, where genocide took place in 94, to Darfur in 2003, when I was the head of the United Nations in the Sudan, and many, many other uh, locations and spots like Cambodia, Bosnia, and uh, um, numerous wars and conflicts around Africa. And there you, you've seen the worst that people can do to each other when uh, hatred gets into the play. And when leaders, bad leaders, make use of people's ethnic diversity <coughs> and uh, egg, on egg on their followers to commit grave crimes against humanity. Now, you may not know about uh, much about uh, crimes against humanity, but uh, you know what crime is. Uh, you know, if someone uh, gets murdered or if there is uh, a robbery, then uh, a crime has been committed against the law and the police investigate, the courts uh, may uh, pass sentence, and that's a normal crime. A crime against humanity is one that is recognized by the United Nations and the International Criminal Court, which sits in The Hague in the Netherlands, as a crime which is so bad, which is so terrible anywhere in the world. And those crimes are, include genocide, when one group wants to eliminate another group on account of identity. So, for example, you've heard about in the Second World War, when uh, uh, Nazis uh, under Hitler tried to eliminate all Jews. So, the Nazis under Hitler, they had the mindset that the Jews were just um, insects, were just unhuman. And uh, six million Jews were killed as a consequence in Europe, and it triggered also the Second World War, and you must have known about that, uh, read about that. In 94 in Rwanda, the Hutus, which is one ethnic group in Rwanda, hated the Tutsis, which is another ethnic group in Rwanda. And within a period of about 100 days, one million Tutsi were murdered in a country that at that time, the population was only about uh, maybe five million or less. So you can see that when hatred gets into the human heart, then mankind is able to commit the most terrible crimes. And some of those crimes are called uh, uh, 
um, uh, crimes against humanity. There is another category of international crimes called war crimes. So at the moment, for example, Russia and Ukraine are at war, as you know. And uh, Russia is uh, attacking the cities, bombarding the cities of Ukraine and is destroying hospitals, health centers, and, uh, homes of civilians. Now, the Geneva Conventions, which are a convention about the regulation of, it's called the Geneva Convention on Humanitarian Law, which governs the way wars are fought. And wars have their limits. So you're not supposed to attack hospitals. You're not supposed to attack uh, water sources. You're not supposed to attack food distribution systems or food growing systems because ordinary people depend on that. When you fight, by all means fight the soldiers on the other side, but you're not allowed to fight civilians that are not part of the fighting. So this is why there is a, a lot of talk going on in, uh, in uh, Europe at the moment about prosecuting Russia for war crimes against civilians in Ukraine. And there are many, many examples of uh, such war crimes that have taken place. So, for example, in the war for uh, uh, Bangladesh that took place in Indira Gandhi's time, the West Pakistani army committed huge atrocities against the East Pakistanis, and that was a war crime. Eventually, India intervened, and that led to the creation of uh, uh, Bangladesh, as we know it now. But the, but the war crimes are another category of international crimes. So crimes against humanity and uh, war crimes. Sometimes they can be the same. So in my career, I have seen many of these terrible situations. And you would think that seeing uh, these uh, terrible things that humanity is capable of, of doing, I would have become quite uh, uh, depressed and pessimistic. But at the same time, I have seen the amazing things that humans do in terms of compassion and kindness. So we have now, at the moment, the Turkish earthquakes. You all heard about the Turkish earthquakes? And you all heard how everyone in the world has been helping uh, Turkey. And uh, there was an Indian medical team from the Indian Army that, has al that also went to Turkey to help the victims. But also, teams and assistance from over 100 countries arrived in Turkey within 48 hours of the earthquake. The earthquake, by the way, is uh, the biggest earthquake for 100 years. And I have myself um, done earthquake relief uh, in a previous uh, Turkish earthquake. And uh, this particular one is uh, um, uh, really devastating. Uh, you, I think some of you may have heard of the, Bo of the Buj earthquake in Gujarat a few years ago. And so you understand the trauma and the suffering and the complete devastation and destruction that is caused by natural events. So on one hand, man is capable of inflicting terrible injuries on other people, as I was telling you earlier. And at the same time, nature itself can do these things. Nature by itself is not cruel. This is not nature saying, this is not God saying, oh my God, let me go and punish the Turkish, or let me, let me go and punish the, the Gujaratis. And nature doesn't think like that. But these are physical phenomena, like the floods and the cyclones and the many other things that we see, the disasters we see. And of course, now we have got climate change, which is getting worse and worse. And so we'll have, we will have more and more disasters coming up in the future, uh, heat waves, drought, and so on. Now, I'll come back to that. But the point I was wanting to make was that against every act of cruelty, there is also act of uh, humanity. So, for example, what is happening in Turkey at the moment? As soon as the earthquake happened, 
uh, neighbors who were uh, who ran out of their homes started digging in the rubble to rescue their neighbors who were still buried under the piles of uh, 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 crumbled uh, buildings without worrying about their own safety without being worried about anything they, it was just an instinctive reaction to wanting to help many government officials police officials uh, reported for duty to the local authority of the cities where these things were taking place and uh, they had no idea what had happened to their own families because these officers uh, also lived in the community their own um, uh, families uh, were uh, uh, buried under the rubble in their own houses earthquake took place very early morning when most people were asleep but their sense of duty was such that instead of uh, going to look for their own families they said right i am a police officer i am a administrator i am a local authority um, uh, official who has to organize the rush to the office to be of service to their community so my point here is that uh, humans have a choice that people have a choice we can either choose to be cruel to people or we can choose to be kind to people and they are both sides of the same coin and uh, kindness and cruelty are basically the two faces of the same feelings that all of us as human beings have so when i was in rwanda all those years ago and uh, i was there in the middle of the fastest killings that the world has ever seen a million people were killed in less than 100 days and i was there in the middle of it watching and you could see that you can just do your calculations even a modern army would find it difficult to kill a million people in a very quick period of time and most of the million people were killed in the 100 days but most of the killings were in the first few days meaning probably you know 0.9 million got killed in the preceding uh, in the first uh, uh, 30 days uh, before and the rest got killed in the remaining 60 days so do your calculations to kill a million people so fast requires killing people at an amazing rate how many you do you have to kill a day how many do you have to kill an hour how many do you have to kill a minute even an army can't do that and it and so what happened was that the million people who died in this small african country and if you don't know you can google it and learn about that experience they, it was done by neighbors because an army, the Rwandan army, could only have killed uh, maybe a thousand people. Maybe they could open the machine gun and kill the 500. You can't kill a million. So understand that cruelty, everyone is capable of doing. So when uh, people uh, were given uh, the order by the government of the time run by this group of Hutus that's a particular group say kill your neighbors the whole population moved to kill their neighbors these were neighbors they were living with these are neighbors living in the same village and they started killing that's how a million people got killed not by an army but by their neighbors when hatred takes uh, root so of course there's like anywhere else there's a lot of intermarriage hutus were married to tutsis and when the hutus were ordered kill the tutsi so hutu husbands had a choice they had to kill their wives because they were from a different group or they could say no she's my wife uh, mother of my children i'm not going to kill her obviously not instead let me die and some made the choice some hutu husbands made their choice and others made a different choice to kill their uh, 
uh, their uh, Tutsi wives. I tell you this story because uh, to pass on one message, and that is that the capacity for good and evil lies in all of us. So let no one think that uh, I'm uh, very good and I'm very compassionate and uh, I can uh, uh, do no, good, no harm. Believe me, if the circumstances are right, then uh, you and I are capable of committing such acts of cruelty also. So, the question is, can we do anything about it? So, uh, so uh, you know, when we had COVID, the vaccine came along and everyone got vaccinated. We have got vaccines against polio, we've got vaccines against many conditions. And you can uh, prevent these terrible diseases, not all of them, but some of them. You prevent terrible diseases by vaccination. But there is no vaccine against hatred. The only vaccine, if there is one, is education from a very, very young age and a culture being created in every community, every village, every township, where ever the virus of hatred grows, it can be promptly stopped. That's why you need laws, international laws, national laws. That's why you need a, a judicial system so that those who make their life out of promoting evil can be brought to accountability and justice. Because if you don't do that, then these crimes will happen again and again. If, for example, uh, nobody stopped at the red traffic lights because it didn't really matter, because there was no chalan, there was no fine, then the system would completely break down. That's why the rule of law, that's why education are so extremely important. And what education does is to build on the instinct for doing good, which is also present on the other side of the same coin, which is our common humanity. So going back to Rwanda, I met uh, this uh, on a recent visit. I, couldn't, I didn't return to Rwanda for about uh, 20 years because I was so traumatized myself. I didn't want to go back because I was so, I had been present when the genocide took place. And I said, no way I'm going back to this terrible country again. It's only when the government of Rwanda invited me as a guest 20 years later uh, that I went back as a guest. And what they said to me was, come back. Look at our uh, country. We have reinvented it. It's a completely different place now. Come, travel wherever you like and see for yourself. And I did. And a couple of things uh, struck me. I met this 25-year-old uh, uh, woman on my second visit, 20 years after the genocide. And she told me her story and who she was. She was a, a, a little baby. She was herself, I think, un, less than five years old during the genocide in 1994. A Tutsi, sorry, a, a, yeah, a Tutsi. So she uh, ran with her parents to the neighboring country of uh, Congo Democratic Republic of Congo to run away from all the people who were attacking her and her family. And as they were, uh, you know, they were, uh, I think, uh, planning to walk uh, about 100 kilometers to the border to run across, and they were spending hours and days, and this little child was being dragged along by her parents. And then she heard a little cry in the bush along the side of the of the road on which they were running. And there was a small child cry. So this uh, five-year-old stopped and ran into the bush where she found a newborn baby, just abandoned, thrown away. 
So she picked up the, the baby and uh, uh, cuddled her and uh, restarted the uh, migration, the, the running away to the border. And the, the village with whom she was running, her parents and so on said, what are you doing? Probably this is a Hutu baby. Uh, throw it away, put it in the bush. The, this baby is uh, uh, slowing us down. We have to run away. And you, you carrying this uh, baby is going to slow us down. And this five-year-old said, no, my baby. I have found it, so it's my baby. And I will not let go. So she carried this, this five-year-old carried the six-week-old uh, baby and would not let go of the six-week-old baby, this five-year-old child, and uh, took her to safety in the neighboring country. Then when the war ended, they came back and so on. So I met her. Now she was 25 years old. And I met the little boy who was now 17, 18 years old, a big, tall young man towering over his now foster mother, the five-year-old child, the 25-year-old mother, and uh, different tribes. He was Hutu, she was Tutsi, and they were now living together again. Her baby that she had rescued, now her adopted son, and they, was, they were uh, living together. Now, this, nobody told this five-year-old what was good or bad. Nobody said any rules or international laws or anything. But she instinctively did what was in her instinct to do. So in a way, when you ask yourself to do good, you're doing no more than whatever you already have in your makeup to do. Knowing also what I said earlier, that you also have the capacity to commit extreme uh, evil also. So, staying with my, uh, uh, staying with my theme, but now switching uh, countries, let me go to Darfur. Darfur is a province in Sudan, which is on the uh, western side of Sudan. It's a very huge region. It's about the size of uh, Western Europe. Uh, sorry, it's the size of France, not quite the whole of Western Europe, but it's a big, big country. And it's about a thousand uh, uh, kilometers or more from uh, Khartoum, uh, the capital. And uh, I found myself as the head of the United Nations in Sudan. When uh, the news uh, uh, broke that uh, there was something terrible going on in the province of, uh, in the region of Darfur, and uh, where we heard stories, again, there was no media that you have nowadays in the same way, but it was coming in. And the stories were that there were massive uh, 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 villages were being burnt, um, people were being dispersed, uh, uh, rape was taking place, women were being assaulted, wells were being poisoned with dead animals. And in, in, when wells get poisoned in a desert region where people depend on water, and your enemy is poisoning your precious water source, there's only one meaning for that. And that is that the killers are trying to eliminate you, eliminate your way of life, eliminate you to run away, to leave this land. It's called ethnic cleansing or genocide. It means the same thing. Right? So these news were, were reaching me, and I went to see and I confirmed it. But I wasn't sure. I didn't know what I should do. I wasn't, by moving around, I'm upsetting these cameras because they have to then follow me. So I'll try not to move too much, but it's boring just standing here. Um, I didn't know what to do. I was a senior UN official. Um, I was a very young UN official at the age of uh, uh, less than 50. Um, I was uh, the head of my own mission. At that time, it was the world's biggest United Nations uh, mission. Peacekeeping was not there, but there, were, there was a, a big relief program, a budget of half a billion, half a billion US dollars, thousands of uh, staff under my 
supervision in a country that was massive and a lot of political pressure from the government in uh, Khartoum, from the, my host government, who were uh, uh, Islamists. And uh, more important than religion, religion is not important in the story, they were, uh, they were Arab. The people who lived in Darfur were Africans, black Africans. Because Sudan lies at the uh, borderline between uh, Arab uh, North Africa and uh, black uh, rest of Africa. And the, the line meets in Sudan. And the nation of Sudan was created after the British gave it independence, British and the Egyptians, who both co-dominated at the time. Anyway, the point is that uh, the Arabs in Khartoum were trying to cleanse the land of the Darfuris. In the same way now that the uh, military regime in, in uh, Myanmar is doing, has done with the Rohingyas who are now taking refuge in Bangladesh and a few of them, some of them are also in, uh, in India. It's got nothing to do with religion. Both the Darfuris and the Arabs in Khartoum, they're both Muslims. In Myanmar's case, the generals and the military regime that is getting rid of these people are Buddhists. And, and the Rohingya are Muslims. So in my experience, I've seen everything. You know, Christians against Muslims, Muslims against other Muslims, Muslims against, and so on and so forth. So it's not religion per se. And no religion tells you to do these things. Anyway, back to my story. So there I was uh, with my uh, uh, colleagues in my office and so on in Khartoum, uh, uh, wondering what I should do about this. I was the senior most uh, UN official. I had a duty under international law to uphold the international norms, including the norms of the UN itself. But if I was to speak up against the authorities, I may be forced to leave the country and eventually, and of course it would hurt my career. And of course, uh, at that stage, uh, you know, of one's career, we tend to be ambitious, or many of us tend to be ambitious. Kiran Bedi was ambitious, but she had, the, she had the courage to take a position. So I was wondering what my position should be, what I should do when I was witnessing with my own eyes mass murder of genocide taking place in this location, having already 10 years previously seen another case of mass murder and genocide in Rwanda that I've told you about. So I was sitting in my office and uh, my assistant knocked and said that there is a mad woman who wants to talk to you. Uh, she's outside in the gate, security, big security gates. Uh, she wants to come and talk to you. And the, the guards were uh, telling her to go away. She was dirty, she was, uh, uh, you know, torn clothes, but she was refusing to go away. She wanted to meet the head man of the UN. So I said to her, my assistant, I said, well, fine, you know, I, uh, I'm doing nothing anyway, sitting behind my big desk with the flag of the UN flying behind me, but uh, worrying about what to do, send her in. So she came in and she sat on the floor. She would not sit on my beautiful leather sofa because she said she was dirty. And why was she dirty? Because she had traveled 1,000 kilometers from Darfur. God knows how she managed to find her way across. And she sat on the floor she accepted my, the tea that I offered her, but otherwise she would not sit even on my sofa. She said, I am dirty. There's another reason why she felt dirty, which came out in her story. And that's why she would not sit on my leather sofa. And the story was, as she related to me over the subsequent uh, hour, 
She was a, 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 a young teacher, lived with her husband and uh, children. I think she had uh, three children in a village in uh, Darfur. And one day, the uh, paramilitary and the military of the government had come in on camels and horses and uh, also um, land cruisers with guns. And uh, they had uh, got all the women of the village together, lined them up, and then all the soldiers raped them. One after another, in front of their husbands and their sons and their families. And she herself, the woman who was sitting on the floor in my office, had herself been multiply violated. But she spoke English, she's a teacher, and she had some courage. So she said, she got up from her place of humiliation and assault, and somehow she found her way to Khartoum. Maybe she took a lift. I'm sure people gave her a lift in some trucks and here and there. And she described her whole story of what happens inside a genocide. Normally, you know what happens only afterwards. When the Second World War ended and the Western troops went in to Germany and to Poland and other countries, they liberated the camps and they found uh, the ashes and the bones of the six million people who had been killed. You only knew that after the war was over. But in this case, the war was still going on. And this woman had lost everything, been humiliated, and was telling me her story of what was going on right now. So I said to her, um, you come a long way to tell me this terrible story. It requires a great deal of courage to say this. And obviously, you do not want to be treated like a victim because you got up from your humiliation and your uh, desperate uh, violence against you, and uh, you decided to come and uh, 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 speak to me. Why me? You don't know me. I, I'm some foreign official. Even you had great difficulty getting inside my office because of the big security around my office. As a senior official, I had a UN official, I had huge security, uh, personal guards and everything. Uh, but, and she said just a very simple sentence. She said, you are the head of the United Nations in Sudan. You are a good man. She had this implicit faith in this institution called the United Nations. And she therefore had implicit faith in an unknown person who was the head of the United Nations at that moment in time. So, and then she carried on. Her second sentence was, I know you will do something. You are the United Nations. You are the head of the United Nations. You are a good man. She assumed I was a good man just because I was the head of the United Nations because she doesn't know me, except for one hour of conversation. And she had this faith. You will do something. I don't know what you will do. That's your job. But I, will, but I know you will do something. So you know, and then she, she uh, got up, and I, and I offered her uh, asylum. I offered her refuge in my office because she was a victim of sexual violence and genocide, and uh, I was afraid what would happen to her if she left my office. Within the UN compound, it was foreign territory. The government of Sudan, which was committing these mass murders, could not come inside, because this was like an embassy. It was protected territory. And now she was under my protection. Therefore, she was, I could issue with her with safety papers, I could uh, take on her case, and, I, and I was afraid for her if she were to leave the safety of my office. 
but she refused. She said, um, uh, don't worry, uh, I, have to, I have some uh, uh, relatives in uh, Khartoum, I will uh, go home, meet with them, change my clothes, you know, and uh, uh, it's okay. And then I will return to your office because I wanted my lawyers to sit down officially and take down her testimony, not just speaking to me, but proper legal, in a legal way. So then, you know, I made the biggest mistake of my life. Because instead of insisting that she stays in my compound, it has, it has bathrooms, it has showers, it has a, a place where she can rest, she can be fed and water, she's safe. I followed her wishes and I let her go, expecting her to come back the following day as she had promised, to give her testimony properly. Following day came and she never returned. And then I uh, mounted my own uh, operation to try and find out where the hell she had gone and what to do. But uh, she never uh, turned up. And I suspect what happened was what I had feared, but I had not acted with sufficient courage. And that was because I, you know, uh, when, I, when I said to a woman who's been, went through all this, stay here, we'll look after you. And the woman says, no, it's okay, I've got my family, I want to be with my family. Immediately you kind of respect the wishes of the person, right? Maybe I shouldn't have, but I did. Anyway, she looked to me a strong woman who knew her mind, as per Mrs. Bethe. What had happened was, as I, as I got the information from intelligence afterward, my own intelligence, uh, outside my gates were, of course, the uh, government uh, agents, and uh, they took her away, and they vanished her. And my uh, theory is that she got killed. But meanwhile, she had left her legacy with me. Because remember, I was telling you that for previous weeks, I was agitating in my head. What to do? What should I do? My bosses in New York were very unhappy with me because they wanted me to keep quiet, to do nothing, not to cause political embarrassment. My UN colleagues didn't want me to say anything because they were afraid, apart from one or two people, and one of them is here, Arachi, who, heads a, who headed a UN agency at the same time. Anyway, what, can, what could I do for this woman now that I had even lost her? How could I be worthy of my high office as head of the United Nations in Sudan in Africa's longest running war at that time, in the biggest UN operation at that time? My job, my position was totally useless. I just had uh, limousine cars and flags and, uh, and a great uh, protocol, but I could not do anything because I could not even save one person. One person had come for my help and I had failed that one person. So these thoughts were going on in my head as I sat alone in my office late into the night. And that's when my resolve came that I could not, as a, as a, as a memory of this wo courageous woman, as a tribute to her sacrifice, the least, the most important thing I could do, or the least thing I could do, is to bear witness, to speak up. And I had already borne witness by going to the region, but I had not spoken up. So I immediately summoned uh, 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 the television people, Al Jazeera, uh, uh, one of the television channels that you know about. There was not much other media, so I went to neighboring uh, Nairobi, where there's a lot of media, and uh, where I gave a live press conference, uh, where I said uh, a genocide, I didn't use the word genocide at the time, but this 
ethnic cleansing was taking place in Darfur, and the government of Sudan uh, was responsible. My host government was responsible, and the world was doing nothing about it. And this story was carried live worldwide. And within hours, it was world news in every city, capital, newspaper, television channel from all over the world. That evening, I gave another uh, television uh, conference. And uh, there was no, uh, I could not do it. My office was too small. There were at least 150 people from the media, from all the channels of the world, who were present in Nairobi, of course, big capital, media capital. All Sunday television cameras and all the radio reporters and newspaper reporters. And we had to do this in the garden because there wasn't enough space. Overnight, this was world news. From a time that uh, nothing was happening to the time that the UN Security Council acted with the statement was three weeks. And three weeks after that, six weeks later, were the first UN observers on the ground. Then within a few more weeks were the uh, peacekeepers on the ground to try and bring an end to the, to the, to the killings. And then, uh, but my point about this is not to tell you uh, how wonderful I am. On the contrary, I've just told you that, uh, you know, I failed in my duty to protect this one woman who had had the courage to come. And that, uh, uh, that failure will, is with me till the uh, last moment I die. But the story I want to say is that this became world news, not of me, not because of Mukesh Kapila. I was not known. But because of the position I occupied. I was the head of the United Nations. And therefore, whatever the head of the United Nations says is news. It's not the person, it's the position holder. Remember that. If you, as you go through life, you will hold many positions in your life. There will be small positions, big positions. You will be big official, small official, or no official at all. But all of us, all of you, have a platform. All of you have even a small platform. Use that platform well and to speak up from it. Allow your platform, your position, big or small, not to be your prison, but your launch pad. If you don't use your, you use your uh, platform to do some good things, to discharge your responsibilities, then you will have failed your platform. Let me finish there by leaving that uh, message. And these stories are contained in my two books, which are available in that uh, bookshop around the corner. And the first one, which describes the story of this woman who came from Darfur who came to speak to me, and other stories from life. These are not academic books. These are from experience. It's called Against a Tide of Evil. And the next uh, book, uh, a few years later, is called No Stranger to Kindness. It's like a mirror of the other book. The first book is about all the terrible things people do to each other. The second book is how the, uh, the many good things people do to each other to counter the, the bad things. So it's uh, like a mirror book. So that you don't go away thinking that the world is all hopeless and cruel and war and conflict and inhumanity and ethnic cleansing and uh, all that. It's also a war where a lot of people with courage are doing a lot of great things. And it's up to you to make your own choices. Thank you. So thank you so much, sir, for your valuable insights in the area of humanitarianism. On behalf of Sarva Mangala Trust, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, for gracing this occasion with your valuable presence and enlightening us with your knowledgeable words. We feel extremely honored to have listened to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We shall now proceed towards the book releasing ceremony and we request Dr. Mukesh Kapila to please do the honors. Adhudai, Matteru Pustaka Pragashna Sharangana, E. Vedil Narakunada. Dr. C. R. Parameshwar and Edia, Himse Petti and the Pustaka Tinde Pragashna Mana, E. Vedil Narakunada. Pustaka Pragashna Karma Narvaikunadinai, Dr. Mukesh Kapilain, 
പുസ്തകം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനായി ചീഫ് ലൈഫോളജിസ്റ്റ് ശ്രീ രാഹുൽ ജെ നായർ അവരുടെയും വേദിയിലേക്ക് ആദരപൂർവ്വം ക്ഷണിക്കുകയാണ് ഓൾസോ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ഡോക്ടർ സി ആർ പരമേശ്വരൻ ടു പ്ലീസ് ജോയിൻ ദം ഓൺ സ്റ്റേജ് ഡോക്ടർ സി ആർ പരമേശ്വരൻ പരമേശ്വരൻ എഴുതിയ ഹിംസയെ പറ്റി എന്ന പുസ്തകത്തിന്റെ പ്രകാശനമാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ ഈ വേദിയിൽ നടക്കുന്നത് പുസ്തക പ്രകാശന കർമ്മം നിർവഹിക്കുന്നത് ഡോക്ടർ മുകേഷ് കപില പുസ്തകം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നത് ചീഫ് ലൈഫോളജിസ്റ്റ് ശ്രീ രാഹുൽ ജെ നായർ താങ്ക് യു സേഴ്സ് ഫോർ ഡൂയിങ് ദി ഓണർ